We begin today's show in Lebanon, where there's widespread fear after a second wave of explosions involving electronic devices went off across the country. Israeli agents are reportedly responsible for rigging the devices. On Wednesday, thousands of walkie-talkies and other devices blew up, killing more than 25 people and injuring more than 600. Some of the blasts occurred at funerals for victims of Tuesday's explosions, which targeted electronic pagers, when 12 people were killed and nearly 3,000 injured, including many members of Hezbollah. This was the scene at one funeral on Wednesday. Lebanon's foreign minister, Abdel Abu Habib, condemned what he called a blatant assault on Lebanon's sovereignty and security, unquote. Hospitals in Lebanon have been overwhelmed with severe injuries as patients have come in after losing eyes and limbs. We saw young, uh, young victims and we saw very old victims. Uh, and all just had the same type of wounds. They had uh, puncture wounds on their faces. They had amputated limbs. They had open abdomens, intestines out, bowels out. Um, unfortunately, um, there were there were wounds that we couldn't explain. There were ruptured eyeballs, there were uh, fractured mandibles, fractured bones, bones out. Um, so, so basically, it was it was the first time I ever see uh, wounds like that. I couldn't even classify some wounds or categorize some wounds. The New York Times reports the electronic pagers have been manufactured by a front company run by Israeli intelligence officers. Many of the pagers were obtained earlier this year after Hezbollah leader Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah warned against the use of cell phones to avoid Israeli surveillance. On Wednesday, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres condemned the weaponization of civilian objects. I think it's very important uh, that there is an effective control of uh, civilian objects, not to weaponize civilian objects. That should be uh, a rule that uh, everywhere in the world uh, governments uh, should be able to implement. Um, the, the link of what's happening in uh, uh, Lebanon with what's happening in Gaza is obvious since the beginning. I mean, the Hezbollah has been very clear in saying that uh, it has launched its operations uh, because of what's happening in Gaza and that it will stop when there will be a ceasefire in Gaza. On Wednesday, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said Israel's focus is turning more to its northern border with Lebanon. He said, quote, we're at the start of a new phase in the war, unquote. Meanwhile, Hezbollah leader Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah is scheduled to give a televised speech today. We go now to Beirut, where we're joined by Lada Bitar, editor-in-chief of The Public Source, a Beirut-based independent media organization. Thanks so much for being with us. Um, these last two days, Lada, have been unprecedented. Uh, you have the shock of Tuesday, um, when um, all of these pagers exploded, killing 12 12 people injuring close to 3,000. And then yesterday, more explosions and walkie-talkies and not clear what other electronic devices. Uh, the total, 37 dead, um, what, something like 3,500 people injured. Uh, can you describe the situation on the ground right now? Good morning. So, uh, as you can imagine, uh, the events of the past two days have caused a lot of panic, a lot of fear, and uh, to a large extent, uh, paranoia, uh, which was aided by uh, the disinformation campaign to a large extent uh, over the past couple of days, or at least yesterday, for the most part. Uh, people were receiving messages over different WhatsApp groups, on social media. Uh, platforms uh, that any and every electronic device uh, can be detonated by uh, the Israelis. Uh, so people were scared of uh, using their cell phones. People were uh, hearing that uh, even uh, kitchen appliances were exploding, uh, solar panels, uh, laptops, and so on. Uh, thankfully, for the most part, uh, this turned out to be a disinformation campaign, and uh, it did not really—was uh, not really materializing on the ground as was being reported across the
different channels. Uh, that's maybe the only solace from uh, the events of uh, the past couple of days, where we saw uh, civilian uh, areas and civilians being targeted. Uh, this has been widely reported in the Western press as a uh, sophisticated campaign uh, that targeted uh, alleged Hezbollah operatives. Uh, but the reality is that for uh, the most part, uh, these explosions were occurring in civilian areas, in vegetable markets, in, in, uh, in the supermarket, and the funeral, as you mentioned. Um, and that's on one hand. But also on the other, uh, not everybody who's carrying these pagers and these walkie-talkies is a Hezbollah fighter, uh, nor were any of them on the combat field uh, or on the front lines in the southern part of the country. It's very important to note that Hezbollah is not just a resistance group or a militant group. Uh, Hezbollah is also a political party here in Lebanon that is represented in parliament. And Hezbollah also runs and operates uh, several large uh, civil institutions. So we saw medical uh, personnel and healthcare uh, workers being uh, killed and uh, injured and maimed by these explosions. We saw children. We saw even the Iranian diplomat. So this was an indiscriminate attack that made the Lebanese population feel that anyone can be targeted at any point anywhere in the country. Well, Elad Abitar, if you could um, respond, uh, give us a sense of uh, what you expect um, Hassan Nasrallah to say today when he speaks at 5 p.m. Uh, Beirut time. You've suggested that this might be the very early stage of a much larger and much bigger war that has the potential to implicate the entire country. What are you expecting in terms of a response from Hezbollah? It's very difficult to anticipate what the Secretary General will be saying today. Uh, but one thing is clear, at least to my mind and to many who are following very closely what's been happening in Lebanon, it seems that Israeli, the Israeli government has already taken an action, a decision to escalate, uh, to wage a full-scale war on all of Lebanon. And it seems to me that it doesn't really matter what Hezbollah decides to do at this point and what form of ret retaliation the party engages in, uh, that the Israeli, that that the genocidal Israeli government has made up its mind to launch a full-scale war on all of the population. And I think uh, the 2006 war uh, between Israel and Lebanon can give us some uh, significant clues as to what could potentially happen. So in 2006, which was a war that lasted about 33 or 34 days, uh, Israel started off uh, by cutting communication lines. That was the first thing that it did before launching a, a wider scale war on the rest of the country. And it seems like this is what it's doing uh, yet again, cutting the communication lines, um, and not just of uh, Hezbollah members, but um, for uh, military personnel, for paramedics, for aid workers, doctors, and so on, uh, causing a lot of uh, disorientation, a lot of chaos, a lot of panic. Uh, and then this would be actually as a prelude to something that could potentially be much bigger uh, and much scarier. Lara Bitar, I'd like to ask you about what the response has been from different political parties in uh, Lebanon to these widespread attacks. Let's just go to uh, Lebanese parliamentarian Mark Dow, who spoke to the BBC earlier today. This is what he had to say. The reality is Lebanon has been suffering for the past 11 months from the war in Gaza, economically, financially, but also because we had some unilateral actions by Hezbollah as well to uh, start bombing from South Lebanon. We're talking to Hezbollah and telling them, you need to take all your decisions within the institutions of the state. Acting as a rogue unilateral actor on the military front is causing all of Lebanon damages because of Israeli aggressions their genocidal war and their lack of respect for the rules of war or even for uh, crimes against humanity. So, Lara, if you could respond to what Mark Dow said and whether this is a widespread belief, the fact that Hezbollah is operating unilaterally 
and that it should not be. It should be working within uh, uh, the imperatives and desires of the Lebanese state. So Lebanon is split between two camps. On one hand, you have uh, Hezbollah supporters who believe that we have a moral, ethical, political duty to stand in solidarity uh, with the Palestinian people in Gaza and also in the West Bank. Um, Hezbollah scholar Amal Saad referred to this as anticipatory self-defense um, and as military solidarity. Um, how you can, we can roughly estimate that about half of the country or so supports uh, this operation and this campaign that was initiated by Hezbollah on October 8th. And on the other hand, on the second camp is uh, fiercely in opposition, uh, not only to this operation, but to Hezbollah in general. And they are using uh, the war uh, of the past 11 months as a means uh, to weaken Hezbollah. Hezbollah uh, to attempt to strip the resistance group from its weapons, to demoralize its supporters. Uh, the second camp has been consistently lobbying the international community to exert additional pressure on uh, the, the militant group. Uh, so right now the country is not really unified, uh, but in, in the aftermath of uh, the two terrorist attacks that took place on Tuesday and then on Wednesday, we saw for the very first time uh, wide condemnation uh, across the board in Lebanon, but also for the first time to some extent in the international community. You tweeted on Tuesday, the day of the pager explosions, we should learn from the mistakes that were committed in 2000 and not repeat them when the next big day of liberation comes, and it will sooner or later. What did you mean? Many of us believe that the liberation of Palestine is inevitable and that it's only a matter of time. In that tweet in particular, I was referring to uh, certain individuals, certain groups, and to some extent some political parties who are constantly agitating uh, against Hezbollah, who, are, uh, who have in the past collaborated with Israel uh, and uh, who would much rather see the country be completely destroyed rather than maintain Hezbollah in power or have Hezbollah maintain uh, its weapons. In that tweet, I was referring to what happened in the aftermath of uh, liberation in May 2000, uh, when uh, the Southerners who had endured the torture, the abuse, the humiliation by the Israeli occupation forces and their Lebanese allies, uh, those residents were asked to simply turn the page, uh, to forget about what had happened, and to coexist uh, with those who had tortured them. And I was just referring to uh, this mistake in particular that I believe has allowed uh, these uh, Zionists to some extent to continue to operate in the country. We saw something happen uh, in the, during the 2006 war, but this was on the level of government officials, and we know this from uh, WikiLeaks cables. Several prominent government officials were asked agitating uh, for war uh, against Hezbollah. They were pushing the international community and supporting Israel to continue its bombardment of all of Lebanon in order for them uh, to get rid of Hezbollah. And uh, that, in my opinion, is a betrayal of the citizens of the country and, uh, and the sovereignty of the country. Well, Lara Bitar, I would like you to talk about what uh, your concerns are about how this war could escalate along the border. I'd just like to go uh, to Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, who spoke Wednesday at an Air Force base near Haifa. I believe that we are at the start of a new phase in the war, and we must adapt. First of all, the center of gravity is moving north. The meaning is that we are moving resources and forces and energy in the northern direction. The action is being done by all the bodies, and the goal is a clear one, and it's simple, to return the residents of the communities in the north to their homes safely. So, Lara Bitar, what do you think that means, they're moving forces to the northern border? 
uh, it's difficult to predict. Uh, but again, looking at the 2006 war, uh, we can expect the bombing of bridges, of roads, power plants, uh, irrigation and drinking water systems and other vital infrastructure. In 2006, uh, airport runway was also bombarded and Israel imposed a sea, air and land blockade on Lebanon. Uh, but I just want to address uh, the point that uh, this war uh, that Israel will be waging against Lebanon is an attempt to return its settlers to uh, the northern part of occupied Palestine. And I imagine that this is how uh, most media organizations will be reporting uh, on this war. But I think it's important for us uh, to go back a little bit in history and recall that Zionist organizations as early as 1919 uh, were pushing for the demarcation of the border after the Litani River, uh, which means uh, 30 kilometers or 19 or 20 miles deep inside Lebanon. Uh, so this is not really very much about returning the settlers uh, to, uh, to their homes, but this is about this uh, long-standing desire and intent of the Zionist project uh, to seize the Litani River. And Lada Bitar, finally, <coughs> or I will should say this, parts of the Litani River. Yes. Will this make Hezbollah more popular in Lebanon and compare its power to the Lebanese government? There is no Lebanese government really to speak of. Uh, Lebanon is still reeling from an economic crisis that started in 2019. The state is almost bankrupt. Most state institutions are barely functional. Uh, there's absolutely no comparison between uh, the power of the Lebanese government in comparison to uh, Hezbollah. Lara Bitar, we're going to thank you very and much. As far as Hezbollah's. Uh, Go ahead. Sure. I just wanted to respond to the question of Hezbollah's popularity and support. Uh, we do know that Hezbollah supporters uh, are uh, only increasing uh, their uh, actions, their mobilizations, their support of the party, and it doesn't really seem to matter what uh, the political group does or the militant group does. Their supporters are fiercely behind them. And what we've been hearing over the past couple of days, but also over the past 11 months, is that they continue to be even more determined to wage this war against Israel. And uh, supporters of the party and loyalists to the party are willing to give up their children, their homes, their livelihoods in support of uh, the mission and political project of Hezbollah. Lara Bittar, editor-in-chief of The Public Source, speaking to us from Beirut, The Public Source, a Beirut-based independent media organization.